Oh. Oh. Boa noite, Campos Pare! Pessoal, ah, pessoal, eu estava vendo, dando uma olhada agora no Jornal Nacional e eu fiquei bem orgulhoso de ver que eles falaram e daqui a pouco a nova capital digital do Brasil. E nós saímos do Jornal Nacional. Rondônia é a nova capital digital da Amazônia. Saiu agora no Jornal Nacional. Oh, é de arrepiar, lindo. Tá linda essa campus. Parabéns para vocês. Vocês são foda. Foda com PH. Vocês são demais. Tá linda essa campus. Tá demais. Eu tô adorando fazer isso aqui. Muito legal. Amanhã a gente passa aqui o vídeo que saiu lá no Jornal Nacional para a gente ver a matéria. Muito legal. Em edição nacional, demais. Muito bom isso. Vocês sabem que no, no começo do ano, no final do ano passado, não, foi no, foi no, foi no Réveillon, eu fui para eu fui para a Flórida e fui lá no Cabo Canaveral visitar a NASA e tive com o Gabe lá e o Gabe me levou para ver a NASA e depois em abril foi a Campus Party Natal e foi meu aniversário durante a Campus Party e aí para me homenagear o Gabe simplesmente colocou meu nome e o nome da minha esposa num tijolinho na NASA como um presente de aniversário por esse cara que está vindo aqui é um cara mais do que um chefe de engenharia, um astronauta da NASA, ele é mais do que isso. Esse cara é um amigo, esse cara que está vindo aqui, ele é realmente um amigo e ele, ele vai passar para vocês uma mensagem muito legal, que é a mensagem de vocês poderem acreditar nos seus sonhos. E eu gosto sempre de chamar ele aqui porque eu já considero ele um amigo pessoal. Eu conheci ele na campus e a gente ficou amigo... E eu gosto do, da voluntariedade que esse cara tem. Esse cara, ele pede para chegar antes, porque ele fica visitando cada escola. Ele gosta de ir nas escolas, falar com as crianças e mostrar para elas que cada uma pode acreditar no seu sonho. E é um trabalho voluntário que ele faz. Mesmo sem falar português, ele vem aqui e ele se esforça para falar com as crianças e mostrar para elas. É um trabalho incrível. E eu vou parar de enrolar, porque a palestra dele é demais. Eu gostaria de chamar aqui ao palco, ladies and gentlemen, Gabe Gabriele. Oh! Olá. It's so nice to be here. Everybody says it's too hot. But I love it. I live by the beach. I'm in the sun all the time. So I feel like I'm home. I want to start by thanking everybody who stops me to take a picture or to talk. I want to know, I really, really appreciate that. And I thank you so much for doing that. So when I'm finished, if you want to take some pictures, I will stay. We can take pictures, we can talk, we can do anything we want. But I will always stay as long as you like. I'll go someplace and we can do anything you like. But I really want to thank you so much for your kindness. You know, my name is Gabe. That's what my friends call me. That's what I ask you to call me. And one of the things that I do, I travel all over the world talking to different audiences, and I talk from kids five years old to adults. And one of the most things I learned about Brazil, and I say this honestly, in Brazil, no matter how many countries I go to, no matter how many places I see, in Brazil, the people have the kindest hearts of anywhere I've ever been. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. And, and I will tell you, especially for the guys. In Brazil, a guy will say, can I give you a hug? And I say, of course. It's the only place in the world where that happens. So I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate you. So we're going to talk a little bit about the space program. We talk about a space shuttle, why we had a space shuttle. We talk about the astronauts on the space station, what they're doing up in space. We talk about rovers going to Mars. 
and the future of the space program, which involves astronauts going to Mars. Maybe some of you will have that opportunity. It's going to be 20 or 25 years before people go to Mars. So if you're in school now and you think it's something you'd like to do, you're going to have a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. So I talk about the space program, but I also want you to think about three things, only three things. Do your best, enjoy what you do, and believe in yourself. And I will tell you why these three things are so important, but it's three things to think about every day, all day. And I always like to tell you a little bit about myself. How many of you know me in here? A few, so not so many know me. So for the ones that don't know me, I like to tell you, when I was in school, I did terrible. I hated school. I loved to play sports. I loved to go to the beach. So I was on the beach, and it was like they took me off the beach, and they put me in a box, and they said, read. And I didn't want to do anything. So I really struggled through school. And to make it worse, I have a twin sister who loves school. So my parents were always saying, why can't you be like your sister? You're in trouble all the time. She's always doing everything good. But in my mind, she wanted to be a teacher. I hated school. Why would I want to be like her? So I had a really hard time going through school. I only got through high school because I loved to play sports. I loved the beach and I loved to play sports. So when I was in high school, I was playing sports in high school and that's how I got through high school. But when I finished high school, I said, I'm never going back to school again. There isn't enough money in the world. They can't drag me back. I'm done, none forever. So my first job out of high school was working at McDonald's, working at Mickey D's. <laughs> I was flipping burgers and making fries. It was awesome. I had no homework. I had no tests. I really had a lot of fun doing it. And I really enjoyed it, but I like to race cars. My hobby is building and racing cars. And no matter how much money, I don't know how much fries I made or burgers I flipped, I could not generate the income to be able to race cars. So for 12 years, I tried different things. I drove a truck, I was a mechanic, I tried all kinds of different things, I could not generate the income. So after 12 years, I said, okay, I have to go to university. So I went to university at night, it took me eight years to graduate from university. So 20 years after I finished high school, I finished university and it was the best thing I ever did. So I always encourage any kids who are in the audience, if you're thinking about going to university after school, try to do that. It will give you so many more opportunities and your life will be so much better. So the first thing we talk about is something called STEM. But I want you to think about something else too. I want you to think you're having fun here. I, one thing about the space program, everything we do in the space program is fun. There's not a day that you go onto the space to, center to me that it's not fun. So I don't want you to think about sitting here in this nice toasty room. I want you to think about being on the beach. We're gonna be out at the beach and we're gonna watch some launches. And I'll tell you what it feels like to watch a launch from the beach. So when we have these launches, I want you to come with me to the beach and we'll talk about it. So the first thing we talk about is something called STEM. This is a little movie about STEM. Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Ever think you could help invent artificial intelligence? Or design the tools used to perform research on Mars? How about finding the cure for cancer or helping to develop a green fuel? Before you say no, think again. Think STEM. STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Studying STEM opens you to a wide range of hands-on, cutting-edge careers and can create amazing opportunities. From designing rockets, to building robots, to writing the computer programs that will change the way we work and live, you can help shape the future of our world. Are you ready for the challenge? Then let's get started. So that, that's STEM, and STEM was brought about in America for a very special reason. What was happening in America, kids were not doing good in math and science, and kids all over the world were doing much better. So they would come to America, and they would take the good jobs. The American kids couldn't compete. So about 12 years ago, NASA said, look, let's get our kids more interested in math and science, and that's how STEM started. We also have something called STEAM that has an A in it. 
science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. So this is a very good friend of mine. Her name is Tina. She's a professional dancer. When I was studying math and science, she was going to Juilliard School of Dance in New York City, and she was studying to become a dancer. And she became a professional dancer. And she taught me about STEAM. She said, hey, Gabe, when I'm studying arts, I have to learn these 10 things. It's a little blurry, you really can't see, but it says, be, uh, be creative, building confidence, solving problems. There's all 10 things that are used in arts that are the same thing that are used in math and science. So a lot of times they interchange. It's very important to combine the two. I was just in Singapore, at campus party in Singapore, and I went to something called an art science museum. It was amazing. It was a huge museum. It almost looked like if you've ever seen this opera house in Australia, this beautiful opera house in the water, that's what this place looked like, but they talked about arts and science and how they were combined. And I thought that was so fitting. Again, it's a little blurry up here. Maybe it's clearer for you guys, but it's a little blurry for me. But you can see all the billions of stars in our universe. It's amazing. Every night when you look up at the sky, if it was completely black on Earth, you would see all those billions of stars. It's the light from the Earth that filters them out so you don't see them. But if you're out in the middle of the ocean somewhere and you look up at night, you would see all those billions of stars. When we had shuttle launches, we had day launches and night launches. And the night launches were spectacular. This was a night launch. At the beginning of the night launch, the moon was actually down on the horizon. It was a big orange ball. It looked like the sun. And as the countdown progressed, the moon rose, and then the shuttle went right in front of it. Now, on a night launch, it's black at night. But when the shuttle took off, it literally turned into daylight. It was so bright. Here's a picture. It's very rare because there's two shuttles on the pad. The main reason we had a space shuttle was to build the International Space Station. It's the only thing large enough and powerful enough to take the big pieces up to space to build the space station. So if the astronauts were up in space building the space station and there was a safety problem, they could go inside the space station for protection. But this mission was going to the Hubble telescope. Now the Hubble telescope's a huge telescope up in space. It's about the size of a bus and it's studying the universe. And this was a repair mission. And there was a concern if the astronauts got up in space and there was a safety issue, there was no safe place for them. They thought they might die in space. So they had the second one on a launch pad as a rescue mission just in case it was necessary. It wasn't necessary, but it was the only time in the history of the space program that they had this picture. Same picture at night. I love living by the beach. You'll hear me say over and over, the beach is magic for me. So at the Space Center or in Florida by the shuttles, you can get in the water and drive along the beach and see the shuttles from the water, or you can drive along the road. You can see them for about 20 kilometers away. They're brilliantly lit up at night. This is called the Vehicle Assembly Building. Many times when you see a picture of NASA, you always see this build, big building and that's called the Vehicle Assembly Building. That's where the vehicle or the space shuttle or the Apollo missions was all put together to take out to the launch pad. And I have this picture up here because that's one of my cars. I love riding around in a convertible out in the sunshine. Every day when I was driving to work, I'm looking at this big Vehicle Assembly Building. It's right next to where I was working. And it's magic because when you see this building, you don't really see a building. You see all the things that happened inside. You see safe spaceships going up. It's just so much fun to be there. As we progress through that, I want to try to share some of that fun with you, and I want you really to have fun with me. So the Vehicle Assembly Building is right over here. OK, this is the Vehicle Assembly Building. Out here, this is the launch pad. And this is the shuttle. The shuttle has four main parts. The part that looks like a plane is called an orbiter because it goes up in space and it orbits the Earth. The orange part is a fuel tank. It has liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. Those are two gases that are super cold, and they're put in this tank. And on each side of it are solid rocket boosters. On the bottom here, I'm not sure if you can see, this is a little person. It gives you an idea how big this is. This is a crawler transporter, and this is a mobile launch platform, and it has to go from here out to here five kilometers away. It takes about five hours to get there. And what they do is they go a short distance, they stop, they check everything, they go another short distance, 
That's how it takes five hours to get there. This is what it looks like at launch. There's three main engines in the orbiter and two solid rocket boosters. Combined, six million kilos pushing against the Earth. So one of the fun things about seeing a launch, when we see a launch at the Space Center, we're about five kilometers away. Most of the public is about 50 kilometers away. So we're much, much closer than most people get the opportunity to see this thing. And when you're five kilometers away, you really get an idea of how powerful this thing is. It literally shakes the Earth when it takes off. So you're five kilometers away, and you can see it, but it's very small. And all of a sudden, when it takes off, your body starts shaking. It starts at your feet, you can't hear it, you can't see it, but you feel it. It's literally shaking the Earth. It's shaking the Earth going through your feet up through your whole body. And you're watching this thing and watching it. The second thing you will see when it takes off is what is called steam. They put almost three million liters of water on the launch pad for heat and noise suppression. Before it launches, you'll see at the bottom of the orbiter something called igniters, because inside that tank is liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. They sit in the hot Florida sun, and any time it gets hot, it expands. So they bend out the top, and there's fumes all over. They don't want to launch that way. The whole thing might go up in smoke. So the first thing you'll see is the igniters. The second thing you'll see is when it gets ready to take off, and I'll explain to you that feeling. And then you'll see the steam being put on the launch pad. So the first thing you're going to see at the bottom of the orbiter are called igniters. They're burning off any vented fumes. Right now is when your body starts shaking. You're standing there and you're watching this thing and your whole body is shaking. And that's the steam. They're putting all this water on the launch pad for heat and noise suppression. It's awesome. It's amazing. So for the first two minutes, the astronauts bounce around quite a bit on what's called the flight deck, like the cockpit of an airplane. You see them bouncing around. After two minutes, it gets very smooth. The boosters fall off, and it gets very smooth. So after two minutes, the boosters have these huge bolts. They're about a meter long and about 20 meters in diameter, and they're literally blown apart with explosive. That's what separates the boosters from the tank. The boosters fall off above the water. About five kilometers above the water, a parachute opens. They fall gently in the water. A ship goes out, picks them up, brings them back. They're cleaned and reused. And then the tank and the orbiter go up in orbit. The tank falls off and burns up in the atmosphere. If you can imagine, it only takes eight and a half minutes from the time it launches to get up into space. So you can imagine how fast that is and how powerful it is that you're sitting there on Earth and eight and a half minutes later, you're up in space. That's how fast this thing is going. Anybody know who this is? Buzz Lightyear. Yeah, Buzz Lightyear was brought into the space program to make it fun. Everything, again, about the space program is fun. And they wanted kids to get interested in early age, so they brought in Buzz Lightyear. Now, Buzz Lightyear was named after a very famous astronaut, Buzz Aldrin, who was the second person to walk on the moon. And I can tell you a little thing that happened to me. About eight months ago, I was out on the beach. I'm always on the beach. I'm out on the beach, and somebody comes to me, and they say, do you want to meet Buzz? I said, Buzz who? He said, Buzz Aldrin. Of course. So Buzz Aldrin comes out on the beach. We get to sit down and hang out with him for about an hour, a guy who walked on the moon. It was amazing. And just to listen to him talk about his experiences was so fascinating. We all sat there and didn't say a word. We just listened. So it was pretty cool to do that. Who's that? Yeah, what he's brought in there, he's at all the launches. I always tell the kids he's there waving goodbye when the astronauts leave, and he's clapping when they come back. Again, you want to have fun. You want to enjoy this. Can anybody tell me what this is? Uh, anybody guess? Put your hand up if you know. The sonic boom. Who said that? Yeah, sonic boom. OK, it's breaking the sound barrier. When something goes faster than sound, it breaks the sound barrier. And one of the most amazing things about the shuttle launch 
when you see the shuttle launch, you're five kilometers away, and you see it take off, and as it takes off and gets further and further away, it gets louder and louder because it's going so much faster than sound. So your mind is playing games with you. How can I see this thing further away getting louder and louder? And it's a rumbling, banging noise. All the car alarms go off, headlights are flashing, horns are honking. It's just a major event when it goes off. To give you an idea how fast this goes, if you're on Earth and you have a rifle, a rifle is a high-powered gun, and you fire that rifle, the bullet goes 3,000 kilometers per hour. As I race cars, I'd love to go 3,000 kilometers per hour. Not gonna happen. But when you're in the orbiter and you're going up in space, you're going 27,000 kilometers per hour. So you're going nine times faster than a rifle bullet. If you can imagine how fast that is in that huge ship to break through the atmosphere to get into space. This is called the orbiter processing facility. Remember the part that looked like a plane is actually called an orbiter. And it's very, very important for me. I usually talk to kids, so it's not, I don't get to talk to adults too much, but I usually talk to kids. And I always say to the girls, all of the girls, I want you to know, as a girl, you can do anything. You can fly the orbiter, you can navigate the orbiter, you can maintain the orbiter. Girls are an intricate part of the space program. So if you're a girl and you want to do something in space, don't let anybody tell you you can't, because you can do anything. Sometimes girls are said, told you can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes girls are told, you can't do that, only boys can do it, but that's so wrong. If you look at the space program in the Apollo days when the astronauts were going to the moon, there's not one single woman anywhere. It's all guys. But one of the major changes with the shuttle program, many, many women engineers got involved. So now there's plenty of women in the space program. And if you're a girl, you think you'd like to be an astronaut, you think you'd like to be in space, you can do that just as all the guys can. So never let anybody tell you, you're a girl, you can't do something. And I honestly believe, I know a lot of guys will disagree with me, but I honestly believe you are smarter than us. <laughs> and so it's more beneficial. <laughs> It's, it really is beneficial to bring women into the space program. You get a different perspective and a little more brain power, I believe. So, so this is called the orbiter processing facility. Anytime the orbiter goes up in space, it comes back down. It's completely disassembled. Everything is checked and it's put back together. So this is a girl. Her job in the space program, every time the orbiter comes back and is disassembled and put back together, she has to put the engine in the back of the orbiter. Now, if she hits the engine on the side of the orbiter, over here, she could damage the engine or damage the orbiter, create millions of dollars worth of damage, and delay the mission. So it's critical she does it very, very well. She has a handheld controller, moves the forks up and down, side to side, in and out. That's how she guides that engine into the orbiter. It takes her three hours for one engine. She's excellent. She never makes a mistake. So again, for the girls or any of the guys, if you think you'd like to do something in space, you can do anything you like. We have these great sunrises that, because we live by the beach. Everything to me is tied by the beach, but you have these gorgeous sunrises with the shuttle on the pad right by the beach. This is called the International Space Station. Do you all know what the International Space Station is? Yes, some of you do. I hope most of you do. Uh, the International Space Station, it's like a huge laboratory up in space. And astronauts go up there for six months at a time, and they're doing experiments. They're learning to live in a weightless environment. They're also doing something in a state where they can do a lot of experiments. A lot of medical breakthroughs are done in space because of the environment they're doing them in. So it took 12 years to build a space station. That was five years. This is eight years. And this is how it looks now. It's completely finished. And the shuttle didn't stop flying because there was something wrong with it. The shuttle stopped flying because its primary mission was to build a space station. Once the space station was completed, the shuttle stopped flying. That was the main reason. So if you're up in space and you're in the space station, every 90 minutes you go around the Earth one time. So when you're in space, you see the sunrise 16 times in one day. This gives you an idea how big it is. Now, that's an American football field, which is larger than a Brazilian football field, and you get an idea how big it is. On space, on Earth, it would weigh about 500,000 kilos. In space, it weighs nothing. If you would like to see the space station, 
Go over your house. It's not difficult to do. All you have to do is go to NASA, N-A-S-A dot G-O-V, NASA dot gov, the website. There'll be a drop down that says ISS. You drop that down and it'll say CDISS. It will ask you for your home address and your email. You give it that information and it will tell you when it's coming over your house. You don't need a telescope. You don't need a binoculars. It's a bright star. You can see it very easily. But you know when you see a star, you're not seeing a star. You're seeing the light from that star. But with the ISS, you're actually seeing it going across the sky for four or five minutes. So remember, nasa.gov in the drop down, see the ISS, or you can just Google see the ISS. It will give you that same information. So there's 16 nations involved in building the International Space Station. And you can see Brazil is one of them. And I think as Brazilians, you should feel very good about your space program. I know there was a serious accident in the Brazilian space program about 20, 25 years ago that just about stopped your space program. Quite a few people were killed and it stopped. But it's starting to reinitiate again. And so many people come to me and say, I want to go to NASA, I want to be an astronaut. I encourage you to stay in Brazil and try to develop your, your Brazilian space program. Try to get it where it's competitive. Why leave your country when you can do something here? And if you really want to go to NASA, it's a great stepping stone. You can get through the Brazilian Space Agency or the European Space Agency, get some experience and try to go to NASA. And I actually met your Brazilian um, Astronaut, who's a super cool guy, for those of you who haven't met him, Marcos, he's a great guy, and he goes around talking to schools about how he became an astronaut. So there is possible to do it in Brazil. So if you have an opportunity to get involved with the Brazilian space program, try to do that and build your own space program here. This is a little movie that's going to show you how the I, uh, whoops, can we back up one? Okay. So this movie is going to show you how it's together. Each one of those pieces was brought up in the cargo bay of the orbiter. They have two big doors. They open these big doors, they put this piece in, and they go up in space. The part on the top are called solar rays. They take energy from the sun, they convert it to electricity, and that's what's used to power the space station. The cylindrical or round parts, those are where the astronauts live and stay. This piece right here is a Canadian arm. It's used to move things around the space station. The part going across diagonally is called a truss. If any of you take engineering or you study any kind of engineering, you know a truss is something that gives the structure strength. There's a truss above the ceiling so it doesn't fall down on us. All structures have trusses for strength. The same with the International Space Station. Someone is flying around at 26,000 kilometers per hour, it doesn't fall apart. You can see the solar rays are brought up in these thin cylinders, then they're expanded in space. On the lower left-hand side, it shows you what piece went up and what it was called. So there's a part that's going to go up soon. It's called Node 3 Cupola. It goes on the bottom of the space station. And it's glass enclosed. Node 3 Cooper, you'll see it goes on the bottom, and there's a cap that comes off it, and in that it's like a big, big window. It's about two meters wide, and the astronauts go in there to look down at the Earth or look at the solar system. And I have a pretty cool movie to show you what it's like to be up in space and look down on the Earth. So it gives you an idea, I like this three-dimensional because you get an idea how huge that thing is. Remember, it's a lot bigger than a soccer field. So if you can imagine a football field going around the Earth, at 26,000 kilometers per hour and being bigger than a football field, that's what you would be seeing. So one of the things that's important, and one of the things I talk to kids about, and for those of you maybe in school, I know some of you are still in school, what you're doing in school, you think you're in school to learn, but it's so important, you're really in school to learn how to learn. As you're passing through school, you want to try different ways to learn. There's many different ways. When America, when we get in high school, we have to write book reports. I don't know if you guys have to do that in high school too, but what a book report is, you'll go in a class, teacher will give you a book, and say read it and write about it. So you have different options. How do you write about that book? You can read one page and write about it. 
You can read one chapter and write about it. You can read the whole book about, and write about it. Try different things. See what works best for you. And whatever works best for you, apply it to everything you do. The easier you can make learning, the longer you'll remember it, and the more fun it will be. And remember, I always say to you, your life should be fun. You should never have stress. You should never have pressure. You should just be able to enjoy your life. And if you remember those three things, do your best, enjoy what you do, believe in yourself. If you can apply that day by day, your life will be so simple. And I'll expand on that a little bit more. So the astronauts, they have to go up in space and build a space station. Well, they never did that. They don't know how to do it. And people say, well, they're real smart. They can do anything. But just like us, they have to learn. So how are you going to learn to do something up in space floating? We're on Earth. Everywhere we go, gravity holds us down. So what NASA said, you know, our body is what's called buoyant. Buoyancy means floating in water. So we float in water. Let's train in water in floating like we float in space. But if we float on top of the water, it's not going to be the full effect. So we're going to try and float in something in the middle of the water. So that's called neutral buoyancy. Neutral buoyancy means you don't go up, you don't go down. So they have a big pool in Houston, Texas. That fancy name for this pool is called a neutral buoyancy laboratory. Again, buoyancy means you float. Neutral buoyancy means you don't float, you don't sink. So this pool is about 14 meters deep by 30 meters wide by 40 meters long. And the astronauts go in there and they train for a whole year. Everything that they're going to do in space, they do in this pool. So if we jump in the water, we'll float on top. That's not going to work. So they put a weight belt proportional to your weight. So you go down seven meters and you stay in there in neutral buoyancy. And that's how they train for a whole year everything that they're going to do in space. So this astronaut, he's getting ready to go in the water. You see the pool behind him. Everywhere he goes, he's in that pool. Somebody's company him. That's part of the truss. If you put that big, heavy piece of the truss, it's going to sink to the bottom. So they prop it up in neutral buoyancy. This astronaut, she's getting ready to go in the water. Now, everywhere she goes, two divers accompany her. In case there's a problem, they can get her right out of the water. Here's something that looks very simple. I race cars for hobby. I build cars. If I'm in my shop and I want to put a screw in the wall, it's real simple. I use my body strength and torque, and I put a screw in the wall. But if I'm floating somewhere above the floor, I don't have any strength or any torque. So something as simple as putting a screw in the wall on Earth becomes very complicated in space. So important you learn to work together and help each other out. One of the reasons I love sports so much, if you're going to be successful in sports, you have to play as a team. You have to learn as a team. And I think sports teaches you so much about life. You learn to get along. You learn to help each other out. You learn to know that everybody is equal on a sports field because you all have a place. So sports are critical for me. And I do a lot of sports. So I like to ask, does anybody know what a triathlon is? Does anybody do triathlons? You do triathlons? <laughs> you know, what is it? Yes, exactly. Triathlon is an event where you swim, bike, and run. Now, I do triathlons, but I do them in a very, very special way. This is my BFF. I know you all guys have a BFF, a best friend forever. This is my BFF. His name is Randall. He's totally blind. He can't see at all. But Randall does everything. And I want you all to think from this day forward for the rest of your life, I don't care what you do or where you go, you got a brand new BFF. His name is Randall. And he'll go with you. And anytime you think you can't do something, Randall will tell you, I'm blind. I can do anything. So can you. So don't ever think you can't do something because Randall is going to be right with you, encouraging you. You can do anything you want. Nothing stops you but for yourself. So if you have any doubts, Randall is going to say, look, I'm blind. I can do anything. So can you. And I want you to think about that. So one day Randall came to me and he said, hey, Gabe, I want to do a triathlon. I said, OK, what's a triathlon? He said, we got to swim, bike, and run. And I said, OK, let's go do it. But he said, I can't. I said, why not? He said, I'm blind. I said, you do everything else. Let's go figure it out. So for the swim, we put a rope around my waist and a rope around his waist with about a five meter bungee between us. We swim about 750 meters. I have to guide him through the swim. I can't pull him. 
or I'll be exhausted. And I always say, I can't let him get ahead of me because we don't know where we're going. So I have to stay ahead of him and I have to guide him through the swim. The second thing we do is we ride a tandem bike and we have to pedal together for about 50 kilometers. And if we don't pedal against together, we'll be exhausted for the last part, which is a 5K run. And we do that with a little 30 centimeter rope. I hold one end, he holds the other end. That's how we do a triathlon. Now, if you've ever seen anybody who's blind walking around, they have a cane. And the cane is constantly going back and forth, back and forth. That's their eyes. That's how they know what's in front of them, whether they're going to trip on something. They have to have that cane to be able to motivate. And I told Randall, hey, Randall, you can't swim with a cane, you can't bike with a cane, and you can't run with a cane. You've got to put your cane down. And that took tremendous courage for him to put that cane down to go do this triathlon. But he did it and he was amazing. So I did something one time, I tried something. I got a blindfold, and I got my own sided guide, and I ran a 5K blindfolded. And I can tell you, it's very, very scary. So I want you to think about something for a few seconds. I want you to think you're totally blind, you can't see, and you're gonna run as fast as you can for 25 minutes, and you're just holding on to a little rope. And I'm telling you, turn left, turn right, there's a rock on the road, there's somebody on your left, I'm giving you all these commands and you're going as fast as you can and you can't see. And I can tell you, having done it, it's very, very scary. But it takes a lot of courage and he has that courage. And I want you all to understand, you have that courage too. You just have to let it out. So if you think you can't do something, if you think you're in a hard way, Randall is gonna say, yes, you can, you can do it, no problem. And for me, I'm very... <laughs> I always clap for him and I like when people do that. And I always tell him how everybody applauds him too. I talk to him almost every day. I, one of the things that was so important for me with Randall was to just be able to do better. You know, I always say anytime you do something, the next time you do it, you wanna get better. That's do your best. Always try to get better. And for me, I'm very competitive. So when we do these triathlons and we do a second one, my main objective is to get there faster than the first time. And I'm a pretty good athlete. I'm actually a better athlete than him. So when we're doing these triathlons, sometimes I'm dragging him and pulling him, and I really know I'm doing good when I hear him praying. God help me, I can't keep up. And I say, if you can pray, you can run. Let's go faster. So we always want to improve. That's the objective of everything we do. So this astronaut, she's in neutral buoyancy. She's not going up, she's not going down. Now this balloon, this yellow balloon, is used to hold that Canadian arm up in neutral buoyancy. And NASA has to have a fancy name for everything. They don't call it a balloon, they call it a flotation device. But it's actually a balloon filled with enough air to keep that Canadian arm in neutral buoyancy. Something they do in space, they have a lot of electrical connections because of the solar rays, they take energy from the sun, they convert it to electricity. So they're always practicing what they're doing in space. The next thing I'm gonna show you, what it's like to live on the space station. Now remember, if we were all on the space station right now, we'd be floating. We'd be somewhere between the ceiling and the floor. We wouldn't go up, we wouldn't go down, we'd just be floating because there's no gravity. So when you're up in space for six months, you don't use any muscles at all. If you stay in space for six months, or even on Earth, and don't use any muscles, at the end of six months, you'll flop on the floor. You have no muscular ability. So every day they have to exercise for three hours up in space. They have a stationary bike. The stationary bike is kind of cool. There's no seat because you're floating. So you don't need to sit down on a seat, so you're floating on this bike. And another thing they have is a treadmill. Now the treadmill's not on the floor like this. It's actually on a wall like that. So they're floating above the floor. They're bungeed onto this treadmill and that's how they run the treadmill. Now, they're nothing weighs anything, so they can't lift weights, but they lift against hydraulics, and they do that three hours every day. So you're gonna see this guy, he's riding this stationary bike, and there's no seat. And his water bottle's just floating around. I'm always looking for mine. Now, nothing weighs everything, so anything floats. You see how this guy's got his feet hooked so he doesn't float away. But you never use muscles, even the crew, to get from one place to another. Go, 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 go
And this guy's shaving. He doesn't have to put his razor down, it's just floating. Now the guy in the back is taking a bath. You can't take a shower or bath, water goes everywhere. So they take what's called a sponge bath. They wet a cloth and they wipe themselves down. This guy's taking a drink. Instead of putting it in his mouth, he just pours it out. Now any liquid goes into a ball in space. He made it too big, so he just cuts in half. Everybody sleeps in sleeping bags. Now you can sleep standing on your head, horizontal, vertical, any position you want. It all feels the same. So if you want to sleep standing on your head, you can do that. They sleep in that sleeping bag with Velcro. So they'll Velcro it into a space, um, into a, a sleeping station so they don't float around and, and bump into something. To get around, you give yourself a little push and you never stop. This great big box on Earth, if this box was in this room, all of us put together could not move it. It's so heavy. But in space, it weighs nothing. So she moves it by herself. And for the girls or any guys with long hair, you gotta pin it up or it'll be a big powder puff completely engrossing your face. So all of the girls or women usually have it in a ponytail. And they're having a little taco break. Now there's no chairs up in space. Everybody is floating. And they're just having a little taco break. Ah, so there's E.T. Everybody says, where does E.T. come from? Now you know, E.T. comes from the space station. He hangs out there every once in a while, comes down, says hello, and goes back up. So he'd like to ask you, any of you out here think you might like to go up in space and hang out on the space station? Yes, say yes if you do. I would. <laughs> I would definitely love to go. I always tell them, I have a desk at work, and right beside it is a little bag. And they say, Gabe, we got one seat. I'm gone. I'm on the next trip. I would love to go up into space. I can only imagine how much, watching it from the ground, I can only imagine how much fun that must be. So next thing I'm gonna show you what is to be up in space and look down on the Earth. So you're going to see a lot of lightning storms on the Earth. One of the things the astronauts talk about, these storms are huge. They're hundreds of kilometers long. And you see a lot of lightning. Also, you can see how all of the continents are lit up. Now, that green layer on the top is called the ionosphere. It separates our atmosphere from outer space. Those are the solar rays. Again, they take energy from the sun. They convert it to electricity. That's what's used to power the space station. Remember, every 90 minutes, they have a new day. So every 90 minutes, they have a sunrise. When they're in space, 16 times every day, they see the sunrise. So those are called the Northern Lights. Now, if anybody's ever seen the Northern Lights, the Northern Lights happen when solar storms come from the sun. They come with electrons, and they bounce off of Earth's atmosphere of oxygen and nitrogen, and they create electrical charge. That's what gives us the Northern Lights. And they can be green or yellow or orange or purple or blue or red, depending on the altitude and depending on whether it's oxygen or nitrogen. I never get tired of looking at this. One of the greatest things for me 
to be at Kennedy Space Center and go around the Space Center, everywhere you go, every office you're going, every hallway you're going, every building has something to do with space. So your imagination is always taking you off to these make-believe places. And the same with this movie for me. I think it's so magical. Just imagine what that would be like and how much fun that would be. One of the fun things for us at Kennedy Space Center, now the astronauts all live and train in Houston, Texas. But when there's a launch, they come to Kennedy. And they come about two weeks ahead of time, and they hang out with us, and we get to talk to the astronauts. Then they go up in space for six months, they come back down, we get to talk to them again. And one of the most interesting things is, no matter how many times an astronaut's been in space, no matter what they do, when you ask them, each and every one of them, what's your favorite thing to do in space? They all say the same thing. They love looking out the window. They love looking at the Earth or at the solar system. And if they're on a spacewalk, it's even more spectacular. So this gives you an idea what it may, might be like to be up in space. This is something called the solar flare. When a solar storm comes from the sun, it comes with electrons. A solar flare comes with ions, protons, and electrons. And when it bounces off of Earth's atmosphere, instead of a black sky, you see a sky with all those multitudes of colors at the same time. And scientists track solar flares because they mess up Earth's navigation and communication system. So if you're anywhere up in the North Pole or north of northern part of the Earth and they have an announcement, a solar flare is coming, try to go see it because this is what you'll see. I haven't seen it, but everybody tells me it's absolutely amazing. So the future of space program involves going to Mars. Now some of you will have the opportunity to go to Mars if you would like to do that or maybe help somebody else to go to Mars. I encourage you, if you think that's something you'd like to do, to do it, and I'll tell you how you can do it. It's a challenge, but it's not impossible. Each and every one of you, if you would like to do that, can do it. It's gonna be 20 or 25 years before people go to Mars, because it's not only getting to Mars, you have to stay on Mars for 23 months before you can come back. So it's not just a matter of getting to Mars right now, we could probably go to Mars right now, but how are we gonna exist up there for 23 months? Nobody really knows how to do that. So that's gonna be part of the learning curve. So if you look at Earth and you look at Mars, you see they're similar. In spite of what some people say, they're both round. Some people say the Earth is flat, that's their choice, but you can see they're both round. You know, Mars is about one half the size of Earth. Our Earth is spinning right now while we're on it at 1,600 kilometers per hour. There's 24 hours in Earth Day. Mars is spinning at about 800 kilometers per hour, and there's 24 hours and 37 minutes in a Mars day, that's called the Sol. And they're both tilted at the same axis. So there are a lot of similarities, and scientists believe billions of years ago that Mars was just like Earth, that it had oceans and lakes and rivers, and it even had an environment like Earth. So they believe at one time something may have lived on Mars, or they think there may be life on it now. So that's one of the reasons, the fascination to go with Mars. So okay, let's jump on a ship and go to Mars. Well, it's not quite that simple. You know, if you're here and you wanna go to Sao Paulo, or you wanna go to another city, you get in a car, you drive one place to the other. Nothing is moving. But if you're gonna go to Mars, there's something called opposition. What opposition means is, the Earth is going around the sun, and Mars are going around the sun. So they're moving further away and getting closer together. That's called opposition. So if you think about Earth, our Earth is spinning 1,600 kilometers per hour. It's traveling around the sun at 110,000 kilometers per hour. Mars is spinning at 800 kilometers per hour, and it's going uh, 86,000 kilometers per hour around the sun. It takes 365 days for Earth to go around the sun one time, that's our year, or it takes 687 days for Mars to go around the sun. So you've got the Earth spinning, Mars spinning, both of them going around the sun, different speeds, different orbits. You wanna launch something from the Earth and have it land on Mars exactly where you want it to go, and it's 500 million kilometers away. So the fact that they can do this is pretty amazing. At the beginning of the space program, the Russians tried it, and they sent probes off to Mars. They never heard from them again. So either they crashed into the planet, or they burned up in the atmosphere, or they missed it completely, and they're still going. Nobody knows. But that was about 25 years ago. Since then, they've really refined it. Does anybody know what this is? 
Yes? A rover? <laughs> yes, this is a Mars rover. This rover is actually called Opportunity. And it was sent to Mars to look for water because scientists believe if water exists, life exists. Now this thing weighs about 200 kilos and it's solar powered. You see the solar panels on it. Now I want to show you how this got to Mars. But I wanted to do something with me and I want you to explain what it's like to be at the Space Center and see a launch. Now every time there's a launch at the Space Center, I'm in an engineering office. So I'm sitting in this engineering office. Over the public address system, they announced there's going to be a launch in 10 minutes. So we all put our stuff down, we all run out to the beach, and we get to watch this launch. So I want you to all pretend we're going to watch this launch from the beach. You're not sitting in this nice, toasty auditorium. You're out on the beach with a cool breeze blowing. You're in a great environment, and we're going to watch the launch. Now, out on the beach, they have a public address system. You will hear all of the different engineers who are monitoring the launch. They will tell the launch director, this system is go, this system is go. And when all of the engineers give the OK, the launch director will start the launch. And when they launch, they count down. Everybody counts down with it. We all do it. The next time you see a launch on TV, you will hear the people in the background counting down. You probably don't notice it now, but you will the next time after you hear this. So when they start counting down, I want you to count down with it. We're going to see a launch. We've been waiting for months. We're all excited. We're waiting to see this launch. They took us from inside this box, put us out on the beach, and we're going to have a great time. So this is a Delta rocket. It's got nine boosters. This comes from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. And that's Mars, remember, 500 million kilometers from Earth. So it's in this nose cone on this Delta rocket. It weighs about 200 kilos, and it's very fragile. So now you're going to hear all the engineers. 35. Let guys go. Let's go. Pressurizing vehicle locks tank. Pressurizing. SSC hydraulic pump control on. On. CLCDR pad B deck flush on. On. Pressure scope. Ten. Okay, so Five. count down with it. Eight. Seven. Come on. I can't Six. hear you. Greenboard. Come on. Five. We're going to see a launch. Jump up and Three. down. Come on. Jump Three. up and down. We're going to see a One. launch. <laughs> now, what do you say? Is they blast yeah. off What's and everybody on? claps. Come on. on. Have fun. We're at the beach. <laughs> <laughs> This really happens. So I want you to experience this. I don't want you to sit there. I want you to pretend you're at the beach and we're getting to see a launch. It's magic. I want to share that with you. It's so special. So you're going to see it's got nine boosters. When it gets to a certain speed and certain altitude, the boosters will start falling off. They call Earth the pretty blue planet because of all the water. So each piece has a function. Some are for navigation, to keep it going in the right direction. Some are for propulsion, to keep it going at the right speed. Because it's got to overcome all of those variables. So you're going to see when it goes by the sun. You'll see the sun and all the billions of stars in our solar system. So I want to ask you, I have one question for you. Can anybody tell me, can anybody guess how long does it take to get to Mars? Anybody guess? Seven months. How'd you know that? Oh, it was up there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so any, anytime it goes through an atmosphere, it generates a lot of heat. So it has to have a heat shield to protect it. It's going very fast, about 3,000 kilometers per hour. Mars' atmosphere is very thin, so it doesn't slow down. So a big parachute opens to slow it down. First, the heat shield will fall away. And the rover's in that inflatable canister, 
with about a 100 meter long rope. When it gets fully extended, it will inflate. It's still going very fast, so they fire some rockets to slow it down some more. And about 100 meters above the surface, they just let it go. And it bounces and rolls and bounces and rolls. Remember, it went 500 million kilometers. It took seven months to get there. It's very fragile, and that's how it landed. And everything had to work perfectly. So first it has to deflate, and it has to be on its wheels, otherwise the mission would be a failure. So once it deflates, solar panels unfold, they take energy from the sun, they convert it to electricity, that's what's used to power the space station. That's a TV camera, it lifts up and actually looks around. Now this is computer generated, it's gonna show it cruising around Mars. But it, what it really does, it goes about seven meters and it stops. And it looks around, it sends a signal back to Earth where a scientist or a geologist will analyze what's ahead of it and tell it what to do for the next seven meters. There's actually three women that take turns driving this around Mars. And they're really fun to talk to, just as we talk about jumping in our car and going somewhere. They talk about driving around Mars every day like it's no big deal. So in a lot of ways, Mars looks like the deserts on Earth. They call Mars the red planet because it's got iron oxide in the soil, which gives it a reddish tint. They also have a lot of sandstorms and a lot of dust storms on Mars. So when astronauts get to Mars, they're not only gonna have to contend with radiation, they're gonna have to contend with sand and dust that's gonna be all in the atmosphere. So it's gonna show you as it comes up, it's gonna show you coming up on a big rock. Instead of hitting that rock and tipping itself over, it will navigate around that rock. And it's went up there to look for water. So well, how does this thing look for water? What it has a drill in the front of it. It will drill a hole in a rock and look at the center or the core. And it will be able to tell, a geologist can tell, how old the rock is and what water was present when it was formed by looking at the center. And they look inside instead of the outside because the outside can change from age or weather. But the inside will be just the way it was when it was formed. It will show you a picture. You'll see different lines in that picture. Each one of those lines represents a segment in time and how that rock was formed. And based on the color, a geologist can say how old that rock is and if water was present when it was formed. They found a lot of water on Mars, below the surface, above the surface, so they really believe that something may be alive in some form on, on Mars right now. A little story about this rover. This rover was sent to Mars 13 years ago to look for water. And so for 13 years, it's been looking around Mars. Its life expectancy initially was only 90 days. They thought it would only last 90 days. But 13 years later, it's still going. It's amazing. But about three weeks ago, they had a huge sandstorm come on Mars, and it covered up the solar panels. And since the solar panels are covered up, they can't charge the batteries. So the batteries have been dying and dying and dying. They put them in a sleep mode, but if it doesn't clear up pretty soon, that rover will stop after 13 years. And it won't be a mechanical problem. It will be because the batteries died from lack of sunlight to charge the solar panels. So this is another rover. This rover is much, much different than the other one. This went up about, oops, hello? <laughs> This one, I give me five minutes, I'm gonna get a hook. No, I hope not. So this rover is called Curiosity. Now Curiosity is nuclear powered. It's not solar panel powered. And it's actually up there on Mars right now. It's looking around where the other rover, Opportunity, is covered in sand. This still is functioning because it's nuclear powered. It's got a really cool laser. It can shoot a laser at a rock and blow a rock apart and analyze what's in that rock. And if it likes what it sees, it's got a big fancy drill. It can drill a hole in a rock, take a sample in it, and put it in the back and analyze it. This weighs about 1,000 kilos. 
The other one weighed 200 kilos. And this is the size of a car. Now I want to show you how this rover landed. Not how it got there, but how it landed. Now remember, any time you do something, I don't care what it is in your life, any time you do something, if you do it again, you want to try to get better. It's real simple. And you should always do that, because every time we do something, we learn. And when we learn, it becomes easier the second time. So they're going to count down on this. Now, last time you guys didn't do so good. I got to tell you, I do this all over the world. I never had anybody sit there like you guys. So try to get more enthusiastic. Remember, we're going out on the beach. We're going to see a launch. And we're going to count down with it when this thing counts down. And we're going to have some fun. I want you to have fun. Life should be fun. I tell people I never worked one day in my life. I've always had fun. <laughs> yeah, it should be. <laughs> and and when, I, when I talk to kids and adults, you, your life should be fun. Usually all stress and all pressure. We do that to ourselves. Nobody can stress you but yourself. And you put pressure on yourself usually it's from its lack of confidence. So you want to learn to develop confidence. Remember those three things. Do your, do your best, enjoy what you do, believe in yourself. It's so simple and it's all mental. So this is an Atlas rocket. They're going to count down. Now they count down a little slow, but jump in and count down with it. T minus 10. Come on. Nine, Can't hear you. Eight. Seven, Come on, Lido, jump up and down, five, we're going to stay launch. Four, <laughs> we're all clapping, three, we're all going to stay launch. Two, one, main engine start, zero, all right. and <laughs> lift off of the Atlas V awesome. Curiosity. Seeking Excellent. For a planetary puzzle about now jump up and down. Ah! <laughs> one of my favorite things to do is watch launches. I never get tired of them. They're amazing. So you're going to see, as this gets to a certain speed and altitude, again, the boosters will fall off. But I'm not going to show you how it got there. I want to show you how it landed. So it's in this capsule. Again, it's going through an atmosphere and it's generating a lot of heat. So it has to have a heat shield to protect it. It's actually got some steering rockets where it can go through the atmosphere at a perfect angle. Same thing, a parachute opens to slow it down. But with Curiosity, when the heat shield falls away, Curiosity has its own propulsion system. It flies around Mars looking for a landing site. When it gets to the landing site, that's called a sky crane. It lowers it down. The sky crane flies away. And this is on Mars right now looking for water, looking for life. Are there any teachers here? If you're a teacher, come see me afterwards. I'll give you something for your class. But if you'd like to share this with your class, or any of you would like to see what Curiosity is doing, it's not difficult. Just like with the ISS, you just go to nasa.gov, N-A-S-A.gov, go to that website. In the search engine, put Curiosity. It will tell you what's sending a live feed back from Mars and you can actually see what it's doing on Mars real time. Oops. So this is what scientists believe Mars looked like billions of years ago. They think it looked a lot like Earth, that it had oceans and lakes and rivers, and they think it had an environment like Earth. So over billions of years, they think, well, what happened to Mars? What changed it from then to what it is now? For the longest time, they thought maybe a big meteorite crashed through the atmosphere of Mars put a big hole in it, and it all escaped. But about eight months ago, they came up with another theory. We talked about solar storms, solar flares coming from the sun and bouncing off of Earth's atmosphere and giving us those northern lights and all those colors. Well, our planet has a strong magnetic field that protects it. Mars has a weak magnetic field. So they think as these solar storms and solar flares were coming from the sun and bouncing off of Mars's atmosphere, as it was turning over billions of years, it eroded away to what it is today. So that's the latest theory on what happened to Mars. So one of the things I talk about, one of the things I talk to kids about, it's so important for me, and it's so important for all of you. I like to talk about dreams and goals, and mainly having fun with life. It's so important. You know, this looks like a NASA shirt, but it's actually a shirt that was given to me by a group of eight-year-olds, third graders in South Africa. Now, I went to South Africa to talk to some kids, and when I was over there, I talked to the kids, 
the kids came to America. And just like I'm talking to you about dreams and goals. Look, if you have a dream, all you have to do is write it down and say, this is my goal. And ask yourself, what steps do I take to achieve it? And go do it. You don't have to sit there waiting. Your dreams can come true. Remember, take your dream, write it down, and make it your goal. And plan small steps. The smaller you go, the easier it is. The easier it is, the more confidence you have. The more confidence you have, the easier it gets. So it continually builds, continually builds. So remember, take your dream, write it down, make it your goal, and plan small steps. The smaller the step you take, the faster you will get there. And people say, how is it possible? If I'm taking small steps and going slower, how will I get there faster? Well, it's really simple. If you go slow, you have a lot of fun. You enjoy it. Time goes fast. If you have a lot of pressure and a lot of stress on yourself, you're miserable. It goes very slow. And I'll tell you, you may have a dream, and you may think this is something you want to do. When you get there, it may not be what you want. If you had fun getting there, you'll try something else. If you had a miserable time, you won't try anything else. So it's very, very important. Remember, take your dream, write it down, make it your goal, and plan small steps. You can do anything you want. You can have fun doing it, and your life should be about fun. So these kids are in Africa, and they're, just like I'm talking to you, I was talking to them about dreams and goals. So they decided, at eight years old, their dream was to come to America. So you can see the name of the school is on the top. It says Laker School, Anton Van Waal, and the bottom says Live Your Dream. So the girls went out and did car uh, fashion shows, the boys did car washes, and they raised enough money to come to America. So I spent two weeks with them. At the end of two weeks, they said, hey, Gabe, we came to America. We want you to go to Africa. Well, my first thought was, why would I go to Africa? It's so far away. What am I going to do when I get there? But it's very, very important for me. Um, I'm on Facebook. If you guys want to talk to me on Facebook, I cannot accept friend requests. I maxed out. The most you can have is 5,000. But you can follow me or you can private message me on Facebook. I promise you, I don't care how many times you write or what you do, I will answer every question that you send me. I do eight hours a day just writing to kids on Facebook. If you have a question, you want to talk to me, I will answer. So I told the kids, okay, you came to America, I'll go to Africa. In the course of doing that, I got to live a dream of mine that I never thought was true. It was a dream I had as a little kid, and the only reason I share this with you is because I want you to know, never give up on your dreams. They can happen when you least expect them. So as long as you don't give up, as long as you stay determined, your dreams will come true. So I want to show you a little bit about my trip to Africa and how my dream came true. So this is actually South Africa. All of the kids wear uniforms. The schools are just beginning to integrate. Most are all black, all white, but they are beginning to integrate. Just like I'm talking to you, I can't believe how many people are out here. I really want to thank you all for coming. It's amazing. I know you're toasty in here, too, because if I'm warm, I know you guys are frying. But I know it's pretty warm in here. But just like there was 800 kids in that audience, and I was telling them the same thing that I'm telling you. All of the classes made signs. Uh, this was a fifth grade class. I thought it was a pretty cute sign. When I went into third graders' classroom, they made space costumes, so we all wore our space costumes. I send a lot of stuff to schools, again, for any teachers, if you come up and see me afterwards. Uh, sometimes there's a long, people want to take pictures, and we, we're over here for two or three hours. I will stay as long as you want. If you want to, whatever you want to do afterwards, I will do. I don't know if somebody else is coming up here. I'll get out of the way so we don't bother anybody, but I'll do anything you like. And for the teachers, make sure you come up and I'll give you something for your classrooms. So I give a lot of stuff to schools. This was actually um, in a high school. They took 20 kids from 20 schools. And I'd like to tell everybody, when I was in high school, if I had to give a talk, I did not go to school. And if they told me, you have to give a talk tomorrow, I didn't go. And I didn't go back until they let me back without giving a talk. I was paranoid about giving a talk in school. So if any of you are paranoid about it, believe me, I was worse. And I'm doing it now, so it amazes me that I do this at all. I don't get paid to do this. I do this for free. 
I do it for fun because I want to share with you how much life should be enjoyed because I enjoy it and I'm no different than you guys. I am thinking of myself as the burger flipper from McDonald's. That's my mentality of myself. So I always feel like I'm like anybody out there. Most of you are better than me. So I had to do this presentation for these 400 kids and I kind of winged it and it went pretty good. So my favorite thing to do when I go to school is when I'm with you again. A lot of times I'm hanging out over there and some of the campus party people are getting upset. You're blocking the aisle, you're blocking the aisle. Or you come and talk to me and they say, two seconds, go. Stay as long as you want. We'll take. And if there's a long line, you can walk around somewhere and come back. I will stay. I don't want people to stay in lines for a long, long time. I will stay there as long as you like, but you don't have to stay in line all that time. So one of the cool things I got to do was play with elephant. Now this little elephant was four months old. It was like a little puppy. It would follow you around. It was so playful. Something else I got to do, which was fun, I got to ride an elephant. Now when you see an elephant on TV or in the movies, they're big. But in Africa, they're huge. So to get up a flight of stairs, get on a platform, another flight of stairs, get on this elephant. You're going side to side, back and forth. You don't think they go very fast. But I love speed, so it was really fun to ride this elephant. So this is my dream. I'm a cat lover. And as a kid growing up, I always wanted to play with baby lions. So when I was in Africa, I got to play with four lion cubs. Now this lion is two months old. I don't know if you can tell, I'm feeding it a bottle. And his paws are almost as big as my hand. So they're just like kittens. They purr and they bite and they scratch and they jump around. But they've got super sharp teeth, super sharp claws, and they're very strong. So I was laying on the ground playing with these little lions, but really they were playing with me. They would drag me one place, drag me back. I would jump on them, they would jump on me. It was so much fun. So never give up on your dreams. They'll happen when you least expect them. And it was one of the most fun things I ever did. So I do this with my cats at home. I always kid around the lion, either liked it a lot or not at all, because the tongue is sticking out. So I really had a lot of fun. So I want to tell you again, remember those three things. Do your best, enjoy what you do, believe in yourself. Your life should be so much fun. So I only have a couple more things. If we have time for some questions, I'm not sure what we're gonna do or how we're gonna do it. But if we have time for questions, we'll take questions. If not, I'll find some place to go out of the way. You guys can come and talk to me. Anything you wanna do, we'll do. So the last thing we're gonna, next thing I'm talking to is something called SLS, Space Launch Systems. It's a rocket that's being developed right now to take astronauts to Mars and it's gonna be 20 or 25 years before people go to Mars. But I wanna tell you a little bit about this mission. Inside this mission is called an Orion capsule. It's a new capsule that's being built. It exists right now. So we're gonna count down just like we did the last two. But this is the third time, so remember, every time you do something, you wanna get better. And you don't care how well you did, you just wanna do your best. And if you've done your best, feel good about your effort. It doesn't matter. And just like enjoying everything you do, if you enjoy everything you do, you always have fun. And if you believe in yourself, you have confidence. You never have stress, you never have pressure, and you never work because you're always having fun. So this, this is a little a rocket I wanna show you. You're gonna see a countdown clock. It's gonna start like at 16. So count down with it. Okay, so come on, 15, 14, I can't hear you. Come on, we're going to see a launch, jump up and down. Okay, stop, 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 stop. Wait, stop, the stop. Is on the horizon. Okay, go. Okay, stop, 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 stop. Take the next step. Okay, go. journey starts with a great ship. The Space Launch System, or SLS, will allow explorers to make greater discoveries than ever imagined. SLS will take us further than Apollo, 
carry more than the space shuttle and enable unfathomable scientific breakthroughs. SLS stands on the shoulders of legacy systems and is teaming with industry, other government agencies, and academia to build the largest and most capable rocket in history. Cost-effective yes. and efficiently designed. Okay, let me finish SLS this and then I'll answer. demonstrate okay. new technology, yes. Your teacher. innovation, and be the engineering marvel of our <laughs> generation. Production of SLS is happening right now. Boosters are being built, engines are being tested, manufacturing has begun. The Space Launch System is an extraordinary undertaking in America's long and storied history of unthinkable human accomplishments. system will lead the way. Okay, we're almost done. One more thing. You know, it really amazes me why people want to take pictures or talk to me. I have no idea why that happens. But, but if you're kind enough to ask me to do it, I will be kind enough to reply. So I, I really appreciate you doing that. Uh, it's just amazing to me. So the last thing I'm going to talk about, now I do this, I just still don't know how I do this stuff. I do this all over the world. I've been to nine countries doing this. I do this with kids from five years old through adults. And it doesn't matter what country I go to, it doesn't matter what age, I always get asked the same question over and over again. Hey Gabe, I'm up in space and I got to go to the bathroom. How do you go to the bathroom in space? So this is a Canadian astronaut He's been up on a space station. He's going to tell you how you go to the bathroom in space. Oops. Next one. We got to go up forward. Hello? Hello? <laughs> Next movie. Please. The future. Ah, OK. No. OK, we're ready. When you go to the bathroom on Earth, you're relying on gravity pretty, pretty heavily. Imagine if you were halfway done and somebody shut off gravity, it would be a mess. And you'd float off the toilet. So, so when, we, when we designed our space toilet, first it has to have a seat belt on it to hold you down. And then we decided to separate solids and liquids because they're easier to store that way. So we just have a tube that you pee into and it has air pulled into the tube, so it's not a big deal. For the women, there's a cup fits up against them. For the guys, it's just like a little funnel. You just pee into this tube, and it goes into a, into a sewage tank. But the solids that come out of your body, that's a harder problem to solve, and it's an important medical one, because on Earth, everything falls on the floor, but in space, it's gonna float around. So, so it, it'll really make you sick. If you re-ingest something that came out of your body, it will really make you sick. And we can't afford to get that sick. So we designed a toilet that instead of gravity pulling everything into the toilet, it has air flow. There's air pulled down into the toilet. Sort of windy when you're sitting there, but it pulls everything out of your body. Everything that comes out of your body gets pulled down into the toilet by the air. And then in the storage tank, we just expose that to the vacuum of space. So it basically just freeze dries everything. So it kills all the bacteria so that there's no smell. And then that, that, we just store it. And then when you have a whole bunch of it stored, we put it in a little unmanned supply ship and we undock it and it burns up in the atmosphere. So the next time you see a beautiful shooting star going across the sky, <laughs> that's what it might be. So, it's really, really important. Uh, you're a little bit older, usually some of the younger kids. I get thousands of letters from kids. I read every letter, I answer every letter, and I save every letter. I actually have this huge box. 
I put them all in this box and I say, when I die, the box goes with me. They're really, really important. But all of the kids say to me, I'm never wishing on a star again. It's gross, it's poop, never gonna happen. But I want you to know, this is a comical way of telling you what happens. You really can't see that. And what you want to understand is, we all wish on stars. We start doing that from the time we're little kids. Our whole life, we wish on a star. So the next time you see a star and you make your wish, go home, write it down, and say, it's my goal. And ask yourself, how do I achieve it? And just go do it. It's really simple. And remember, go slow. The slower you go, the easier it is, the more fun you'll have, and the faster you'll get there. And never give up on your dreams. You know, I, I'm writing to a lot of kids now, they say, I want to be an astronaut. Okay, be an astronaut. But understand, it's going to be 20 or 25 years before that happens. So don't be in a hurry. You know, don't worry about getting there quickly. Worry about enjoying the journey. That's what's so important. So a lot of people say, why do we go in space? We're just wasting our money and wasting our time. Wait. There's something called spin-off technology. Now, spin-off technology are things that develop in space and used on Earth. All of our cell phones, all of our electronics, all our computers, all that stuff was developed in the space program. A lot of medical breakthroughs are done in space. They're trying to find a cure for cancer. So all of these things are happening in space that help us on Earth. People say, can I be an astronaut? Anybody can be an astronaut. You can be almost any age, any size, any color. If you want to be an astronaut, I encourage you, try to do that. And if you don't make it for whatever reason, you're going to have such a great education, you can do almost anything anyway. But try to do it. Most of the astronauts, they just kind of lucked out. They're all highly qualified, but not all of them can make it. So it might be you, but try. Try to do anything you want. So this concludes the presentations. Uh, before, before I let you go, I want to just do one thing. If you just stay, hang with me. I'd just like to take some pictures. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to say three, two, one, and I want you to yell out space. So I'll try and take maybe six or seven pictures of all of you, okay? Are you ready? Three, two, one. Yeah. <laughs> okay, come on in here. Ready? Three, two, one. Awesome. That was really great. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. Yeah. Awesome. All right, getting better. See, every time you do it, you're getting better. Perfect. Ready? Three, two, one. Yeah. Awesome. All right, last group. I'll do two more. Three, two, one. Yeah. Awesome. Ready, guys? Three, two, one. Yeah. Awesome. The last thing I want to say to you all before I go. I think they want to take some selfies, so stay here for a few minutes. But the last thing I want to say to all of you, from my heart, Moito Abrigado. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So once they take some pictures, uh, I'll be going over there. If you want to talk and do anything you want to do, I'll stay as long as you like. Pessoal, espera um pouquinho que a gente quer fazer uma selfie aqui, uma big selfie com o Gabe. Pessoal, levanta o braço assim. Tá. Todo mundo, uou! <risos> Okay, good. Okay, thank you again. Muito obrigado. Thank you all so much. You've been awesome. I really appreciate you so much.